Whilst doing research for a different video I put out a few days ago, one of the players I came across, because it was concerning every Premier League club's record goal scorer of all time, went by the name of Luther Blissett. Blissett is one of Watford FC's greatest ever players, if not the greatest in their history, and he is the club's record appearance maker and goal scorer of all time, with 186 goals in 503 games spread out across three different spells for the Hornets. I then remember that there have been some kind of rather weird and bizarre cults relating to Blissett during, and indeed after, his playing days, and after rereading Colin Murray's fantastic book entitled A Random History of Football, where the cult had an entire chapter dedicated to it, I realised that it was something that I wanted to look a bit more into for a video. It must be stressed of course that I am not copy and pasting what Murray wrote, because as it turns out, there is a lot more than what originally met the eye, although it was of course a useful starting point for my research, and I would highly recommend the book as a whole for you to check out, because it is genuinely brilliant. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to talk about perhaps the most bizarre cults relating to a football player in the entire history of the sport, the myths surrounding it, and what it actually did, plus quite a mental twist at the end, which I had absolutely no idea about prior to researching this video. Before I get into that though, I think it's important to talk about the player that Luther Blissett was, and why a cult that related to him, but that he himself wasn't actually involved in, came about. And of course, if you go on to enjoy this video, don't forget, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. Blizzard was born in 1958 in Falmouth in Jamaica, which is the same town that sprinters Ben Johnson and Usain Bolt were born in, although he and his family moved to England at a very young age. He left school at the age of 16 to join Watford as an apprentice, and by the end of the following campaign, he had made his professional debut for the club, who were then in the 4th division. After a further season of bedding in, he became the club's first choice striker upon the appointment of Graham Taylor as manager in 1977, scoring 6 goals in 33 games as the Hornets finally won promotion back to the 3rd division after 3 seasons stuck in the basement tier, by this point owned by pop superstar and ardent Watford fan Elton John. Alongside strike partner Ross Jenkins, they scored a combined 50 goals, Blissett grabbing 21 of them, in the next campaign to fire the club to back-to-back -to -back promotions, and after a couple of seasons of consolidation, they finished in second and went up to the first division for the first time in their history, with Blissett hitting double figures for goals in each of those three campaigns. The club then went and stunned everyone, perhaps even their own fans, by finishing in second place in their debut campaign in the top flight, albeit some 11 points behind champions Liverpool. But it was undoubtedly Blissett's finest campaign in his career, as he bagged 27 league goals to win the Golden Boot that year. He even scored a hat-trick on his England debut against Luxembourg in a 9-0 trouncing of the European minnows, becoming the first black player to score for England in the process. Soon, European giants started sniffing around, although it would be AC Milan who would be the ones to secure his signature for around £1 million in the summer of 1983. It's worth noting that Milan, at this point, were not the powerhouses that they would become after Silvio Berlusconi's purchase of the club in 1986. They had actually just been promoted back to Serie A after a season spent in Serie B, their second in that division in just three years, after being forcibly relegated in 1980 owing to their participation in the Tottenham match fixing scandal, and their incumbent chairman, Giuseppe Farina, was actually on the verge of going bankrupt. Regardless, the press hype surrounding Blitz's arrival was absolutely huge, with Gazette de la Sport running multiple headlines pondering how many teams he would score against, and it looked like he might prove to be the real deal, as he scored seven times in seven preseason fixtures. He scored in his second game in Serie A against Hellas Verona, although from that point until the 29th of April, he only scored twice more, with one barren spell in particular lasting for over three months. By November, a section of the AC Milan fans had started to turn on their big money striker, and there were rumours of an imminent return to England. He didn't exactly help his cause on quite a few occasions though, skying his first penalty that he took at the San Siro way into the stands, which the fans responded to with rounds of applause, and missing a chance against bitter rivals into Milan from about a yard out. One of the big problems that he encountered was the sudden change of style of play that he had to get used to, as back in England he had benefited greatly from the direct style of play of Graham Taylor's at Watford, but in the more technical Serie A, Blissett struggled, as Milan's style of play meant that he had to contribute more in the build-up play than he had back in England, something which often resulted in him losing the ball owing to a slightly inferior first touch and ball control to some of his contemporaries and indeed teammates. 
He did, however, score in his final two games in the league against Torino and Pisa, and for the goal in the latter game, which won Milan the game against Pisa, who would be relegated as a result of their defeat, Livorno fans, who hold a great rivalry with the region of Pisa as a whole, unveiled banners after the match, which simply said, Thank you, Blissett. Nevertheless, it was a disappointing season for Milan, who came in sixth with a minus three goal difference, and Blissett's five goals in the league actually made him the joint second top scorer for the club that season behind only Giuseppe Damiani, although he himself only managed seven as the Rossoneri scored just 37 goals across their 30 games. Throughout most of the campaign, myths have been speculated about Milan's original purchase of Blissett, who had remarked as a throwaway response to a journalist's question about living in Italy that one of the main difficulties about living there was that you were unable to buy Rice Krispies, although he later said that this response was a complete joke. Regrettably, quite a few of those myths were inextricably connected to racial stereotypes, with one of them being that they had actually signed his brother instead, hence his poor form, and I don't think I need to explain the problem behind that one. Another was that Milan had actually intended to sign talented winger John Barnes, who also played for Watford at the time, although as Gabriele Marcotti pointed out, it was quite clear that Milan were in the market for a striker as opposed to a winger, and Barnes does not, and certainly didn't back then, look the same as Blissett. However, in a country where racial prejudice was still quite prevalent and very few black players actually plied their trade in Serie A, it is perhaps unsurprising, if obviously still abhorrent, that these claims spread around like wildfire and were seen by some as explanations behind Bliss's underwhelming spell in Milan. Blissett would return to Watford within a year at a £450,000 loss on AC Milan's part and he immediately regained his form with 21 goals in the league. After that though, he would only hit double figures for goals once in the next three seasons, and while for a relegated from the first division in 1988, with Blissett shipped onto Bournemouth the next year, for whom he hit a very respectable 56 goals in 121 games. He then made one last move back to Vicarage Road in 1991, hitting 10 more goals in his final season with his boyhood club, before his career petered out with West Brom, Bury, Mansfield and Fakenham Town of the Eastern Counties Football League, retiring in 1995. You would think, and I presume he would also have thought, that this would be the end of Luther Blissett in the spotlight for a while, but as you may have guessed by what this video is primarily about, that is far from what happened. A cult started to gain traction throughout Italy in 1994, one year before Bliss had stepped back from the playing side of football, and it stemmed from Bologna, about two and a half hours southeast of Milan by car. A group of writers, who were also left-wing anarchists, came together to create a group, which they entitled the Luther Blissett Project. And at this point, if you were taking a shot every time I say the words Luther or Blissett, then I'm sorry for the trouble I have caused you thus far and will continue to cause. The reason as to why they chose his name remains, like many of the group's activities, shrouded in mystery and myth, although a few explanations by group members and Blissett himself have been posited. The Englishman believes that one of the key reasons behind them choosing him was because he was one of the few black players in the league at the time, and therefore he stood out amongst the crowd. However, whilst his time in Milan did obviously play a role, considering I doubt they would have heard of him if he hadn't actually played in Italy at some point in his career, there are varying accounts from the members of the group as to why they chose Blissett's name in particular. One member explained that, quote, we needed the name of someone who had been stupidly underestimated and misunderstood. Close quote. Another stated that they chose his name as a result of him being so bad in Milan, which then made him seem good, comparing Blissett to Ed Wood, a film director who made classics such as Plan 9 from Outer Space, widely cited as one of the best worst films of all time, if that makes sense, and the pornographic film Necromania, and after reading the plot of the film Necromania on Wikipedia, I am now mentally scarred. Perhaps the explanation which makes the most sense in my eyes at least was put forward by Roberto Bui, a founding member of the Luther Blissett Project, when he explained that it was to do with mythopoesis, the social process of constructing myths and then disseminating them out as far as possible. This is important in the context of Blissett's time in Italy because, as mentioned earlier, there had been plenty of myths circulating around Italy about him being supposedly the wrong person when Milan originally signed him. Not only that, but the Luther Blissett project itself was partly built on the premise of mythopoesis, as they would create stories that were completely fabricated in the hopes that they would garner news attention, be widely publicised, and subsequently show how gullible news outlets at the time were, before revealing that it was all a hoax and putting the name Luther Blissett to their actions as a pseudonym. They called their pranks a quote, form of art, close quote, 
and a quote, guerrilla warfare on the cultural industry, close quote, and to some extent it was relatively successful. So you might be thinking at this point, well what myths did the Luther Blizzard project actually create? Well there are quite a few stories that they spread to the media which I will tell you about now. The first came in 1995 when a group of youths were purportedly arrested for going on a bus without tickets and when they were each asked for their names at the police station they all replied with Luther Blissett, although this story is likely apocryphal. Two more would follow that year, with one concerning a chimpanzee who was also an artist and was about to have her paintings displayed at the Venice Biennale of Contemporary Arts, which actually was reported by a few newspapers, but of course was completely untrue. The other centred on a British cyclist called Harry Kipper who disappeared on his travels whilst in northern Italy, which was sent to a TV programme focusing on missing persons. It is also speculated that the company actually sent a crew to try to find Kipper, even going so far as London to track him down, but just before the program went to air, the realisation hit home that they had been duped. The people under the name of Luther Blissett revealed themselves to be behind the stunt, stating in a press release that Schich la Visto is a Nazi pop expression of the need for control. Close quote. In 1997, they released stories that Christian witch hunters, black masses and Satanism were very prevalent amongst people in the backwoods of Viterbo, located in the south of Italy. It attracted attention from both local and national media, but then even politicians were caught up in the paranoia that it created, especially after a fake video of a satanic ritual was broadcast live on TV, given that no one actually took the time and effort to fact check it and make sure that it was actually untrue. Of course, it was all uncovered to be the work of the Luther Blissett project, and how they managed to pull it off so successfully for so long has now been used in studies and analyses by plenty of media experts. One year later, tales of Serbian sculptor Darko Mavel, who allegedly made life-size sculptures of corpses, were subsequently censored as a result of his work, and then pictured dead in confinement after a NATO bombing began to be spread by the Luther Blissett project. His works were even displayed in both Bologna and Rome, but eventually the truth came out that the sculptors were actually real people who had in fact died, and that the photo of Marver was actually a photo of a member of the Luther Blissett project who hailed from Sicily. The final work that the members of the Luther Blissett project conducted was when four of them came together to write a book entitled Q. It's a crime thriller set in 16th century Europe and amongst riots and rebellions by civilians, before they were eventually put down by a repression which was approved by Martin Luther, who, if you haven't figured it out by now, has the same last name as Blissett's first name. The book was originally solely released in Italy before being translated into more than 10 languages, including English, and it was given an English release in 2003. The nom de plume that the authors used for this book was, in case you somehow hadn't figured it out by now, Luther Blissett. This was the last thing that the Luther Blissett project would do as part of their five year plan, with its conclusion being marked by the release of a CD called Luther Blissett The Open Pop Star, which I am told is a compilation of various electronic noises, sounds and voices. The members subsequently committed seppuku, translated into English as samurai ritual suicide, although it must be noted that they didn't actually kill themselves, they just put an end to the actual project. They would then go on to create a new form of the group entitled Wu Ming, which follows the same principles and has the same beliefs as the Luther Plissett project, and, apparently, are still as radical as they were before. However, the adoption of the name Luther Blissett in various circles as an alias has continued on in perhaps more earnest than it did before, with squatters often going by the name, stage performers adapting it for their stage name, and even poets who wish to remain anonymous signing off their works with the initials LB. Furthermore, when it was reported that hackers had stolen the text for the forthcoming Harry Potter book, which did make global news, someone came forward under the name Luther Blissett and said that it was a hoax to see how easy it was to manipulate the media. One of the group's philosophies was Shunque puo essere Luther Blissett semplicemente adottando il nome Luther Blissett, meaning anyone can be Luther Blissett simply by adopting the name Luther Blissett, something which the real one read out whilst appearing on ITV's Fantasy Football League during Euro 2004. Perhaps that's why the phenomenon of using Blissett's name in a multitude of different scenarios and aliases is still as alive as ever. Blissett has mostly remained ambivalent about the whole thing, although at first he was rather discomforted, saying, quote, It's something that I've stayed clear of. You've got no control over these kinds of things. Nobody asked my permission to use my name or anything like that. But what can I do about it? 
they get on with it and I observe from a distance. Close quotes. In recent times though, he has been more receptive to it and in an interview with Rai2 on Italian TV, he said that it was quote unquote a great honour to be linked with the project and what they have achieved with his name, something which the Wu Ming group themselves, who of course were the sequel to the Luther Blissett project, responded to on their Twitter page. You might think at this point that that's quite a nice way to end this video and a happy ending with Blissett acknowledging the project and the project themselves being happy that Blissett acknowledged it. And that's a nice way to conclude the story. And I thought it would end there too. But somehow it gets even weirder and I didn't even think that was possible. In October 2017, a user on 4chan, a social media site where anonymous and extremist movements have been commonplace over its 14 prior years of existence and 18 years overall, published a series of what was entitled Breadcrumbs, alleging that then US President Donald Trump was waging a war on politicians, business people and journalists who are apparently Satan-worshipping paedophiles and drinking children's blood in order to stay young. This theory has since been debunked by the way, but still many people somehow believe it, simply because they haven't been bothered to fact check this information, or at the very least, fact check it through veritable websites. These quote unquote breadcrumbs were posted not long after Petergate, which reported with no evidence whatsoever that the Democratic Party had imprisoned children as sex slaves, had been disseminated by the old right. And this new theory on 4chan reached the point where some thought that the likes of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were caught up in it and were due to be arrested, child, and perhaps even executed for their supposed crimes. The user who posted it went by the name of Q, and within a month of the original post, the book of Q was published, with the movement later going on to be titled QAnon. QAnon has garnered a lot of traction ever since 2018, and even more so over the coronavirus pandemic, with COVID denial rallies in countries as far out as Germany and the Netherlands seeing protests as linked to the alt-right movement. During a CNN bulletin on QAnon members who had gone to see a Trump speech in, I believe, Pennsylvania, one supporter told the person who was interviewing him about his beliefs that the journalist who was interviewing him was somehow connected to the CIA without him even knowing, which, whilst quite a scary belief to actually have and say on live TV, is also quite bold. Trump himself never distanced himself from the movement and even went so far as to say that he was fine with it because they said nice things about him and quite a few QAnon members apparently ran for office. The movement perhaps reached its peak in January of this year when, during the Trump incited march on the White House demanding justice for the supposedly rigged election in November 2020, many protesters were self-professed QAnon members. Okay, Harry, now you've gone way too far. You've all of a sudden lurched from the Luther Blissett Project and all of a sudden you're now talking about QAnon. Where's the link to the Luther Blissett Project with this alt-right movement that completely deviates from the left-wing beliefs of the original group? I hear you complain slash ask. Well, we mustn't forget that the user who originally posted those messages was entitled Q, the same name as the book that was published under the alias of Luther Blissett some 18 years beforehand. The plot of the book is eerily similar to the QAnon conspiracy theory, as activists who want to disrupt the normality of society take centre stage, but a spy sent from the church, who is called Q in this book, attempts to bring them down by spreading lies about them and putting down their numerous revolts in order to maintain the church's dominance over the people. Furthermore, American lawyer John F. Kennedy Jr. is said to be one of the key figures of the movement, having supposedly renamed himself QAnon and become the focal point of it, despite having actually died in a plane crash in 1999, the very year that Q came out in Italy, it must be noted, and many of the elements upon which QAnon was originally disseminated, namely paedophilia, Satanism and the church, were involved in pranks pulled by the Luther Blissett Project during the 1990s. With this in mind, in 2018, the popular website BuzzFeed published an article theorising that QAnon was actually a left-wing prank to, in their words, make the far right look more deranged, close quotes, and that it was linked to the Luther Blissett Project. Of course, the Luther Blissett Project members made themselves, and indeed the group as a whole, much more popular by virtue of mythopesis, which is the art of spreading myths and media hoaxes to test how gullible people are. And considering QAnon was seen to have been a left-wing prank by some articles and news outlets, and the user entitled Q had posted what was obviously a fake story, the connection was made. 
Indeed, when the author of the original BuzzFeed article, Ryan Broderick, got in contact with three of the authors of Q through email, they told Broderick that the similarities between QAnon and their book were too similar to be treated as mere coincidence, and that it was, in all likelihood, a left-wing originated prank that had spiralled out of control. They did also add at the end of their correspondence with Broderick, which they posted on their Wooming Foundation website, that it wasn't them who posted the original comments on 4chan, stating that it would be, quote, way too dangerous, close quote. And sadly, so it has proved. An anonymous post that may well have attempted to discredit the alt-right by posting such insane drivel that it couldn't possibly be true has now been taken by these people as gospel and, in recent times, reached new heights in terms of its danger, popularity and untrue conspiracy theories, and it most definitely isn't a laughing matter anymore. Therefore, to summarise this previous section, and more broadly the video as a whole, an alt-right movement whose members stormed the Capitol building in January 2021 was potentially as a result of a left-wing prankster who went under the name of Q on 4chan, posting myths about Trump waging a war on pedophiles on that social media platform in October 2017, whose fabrications shared similarities with the actual plot of the book of the same name, which was written by four Italian authors under the pseudonym of Luther Blissett, whose real identity was a Jamaican-born English striker who just so happened to have had a subpar spell at AC Milan in the mid-1980s, which inspired a cult to be named after him. And I think that convoluted and quite ridiculous sentence, but also probably nonetheless very true sentence, is a very appropriate way to wrap up a video about one of the most bizarre cults of all time that has nothing to do with football apart from originally being named after a Watford legend, and an AC Milan flop. This has been one of my favourite videos that I've ever researched and made, as it has taken me down rabbit holes I didn't actually think were possible to go down. And at the end of it all, the whole thing is still shrouded in all kinds of mystery, misinformation and speculation. Perhaps therefore, that's what the original members would have wanted, although admittedly, not to the extent of having QAnon be a thing, as they've said themselves. But if you found it as interesting or just generally enjoyable as I did, then don't forget, as I said at the start of this video, to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And you can ring the notification bell to the side of the subscribe button once you've pressed it to get notified whenever I upload a video straight away. And then you'll never miss out on a video that I upload. But thank you very, very much for watching. I really do hope you've enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll see you then.